Good morning and a warm welcome to you as you join us for worship here in Aiken Parish in York. You are most welcome. Welcome in the name of Christ. God's grace, mercy and peace be with you. We pray. Loving God, we have come to worship you. We say this prayer together. Help us to pray to you in faith, to sing your praise with gratitude and to listen to your word with eagerness through Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to join in together our first hymn this morning, Just As I Am Without One Plea. Let's sing. I do hope you've been enjoying using this Live Lent booklet as you go through it day by day throughout Lent. I wonder how you're getting on with the action from last week, which you were asked to consider across these few days. How are you thinking about your life and how it's changed since you have come to know Christ? And when? in particular have been the moments that you have felt close to Christ. 
as we seek always to walk his ways and to be close to him and to be changed, to be transformed by Jesus. Let's pray our prayer for today, the third Sunday of Lent. Let's pray. Almighty God, whose most dear Son went not up to joy, but first he suffered pain, and entered not into glory before he was crucified. Mercifully grant that we, walking the way of the cross, may find it none other than the way of life and peace, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first reading today is from one of Paul's letters, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demanded signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We're going to sing again a fairly modern hymn, but I think we've sung it quite a number of times and probably know it fairly well. But this is sung by somebody different, someone called Nicky Rogers. And the song which you might like to join in with is In Christ Alone My Hope Is Found.
of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day. Up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse is In a moment, Henry is going to share the Gospel reading with us. And following that, I'm delighted that we have a visiting speaker this morning. Jane is the chaplain for York St John's University here in York. And she's going to share with us. As a way of reflecting on all that she shares with us, following her words, you will hear a piece of organ music and see some images as you reflect on her words. And so, over to Henry. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons, and the money changers sitting there, and making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple, with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers, and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It has taken forty-six years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When, therefore, he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the Gospel of the Lord. It's a delight to be invited to speak to you today. As Pete said, I'm Jane Speck, and for the past two years, I've been the chaplain at York St John's University. 
I work there with staff and students offering spiritual exploration, um, faith provision and pastoral care to everybody who is there. I'm basically there to drop everything for a coffee and a chat at a moment's notice, which is something I find I'm ideally suited to. My family and I moved to Acom 18 months ago, just six months before the first lockdown. So in a weird way, this last year has been kind of good for us. Around the homeschooling, uh, the working and the unpacking that we still had to do, we found that we had the time to really settle in to our new house and the neighbourhood. Confined to the area, we walked every street, we explored every corner on our daily exercise and we got to know the inside of Morrison's extremely well. So you'd think after a year in lockdown, more or less, that our new house would be completely sorted and immaculate because we've spent so much time in it. Ah. I think what we've actually done is stopped seeing it for what it is. I'm afraid that I'm rather of the opinion that housework is a necessary evil and there's always at least 10 other things that I would rather be doing. So pre-COVID, I'd rely on a regular flow of visitors to force us into clearing. Uh, cleaning, you know how it is when you've got people coming round and you see your house suddenly through the eyes of an outsider and think, mm, I better do something. It's very galvanising. Not having had visitors for a long, long time, though, things can slip a bit. I realise that I've stopped seeing the piles of papers and toys around the place, what we call the silt that builds up in the corners. So reading today's gospel story about Jesus in the temple, I got to wondering whether something similar had happened there. By the time Jesus's cousin, John the Baptist, had turned up in first century Palestine, there hadn't been a prophet in Israel for around 500 years. The Jewish people had got pretty used to ordering all things religious in their own way, and they hadn't had the kind of challenge to their housekeeping that the prophets generally brought. Bad habits had crept in the temple, the centre of their faith and the place where Yahweh himself was believed to reside had slipped a bit. You can imagine Jesus going there as Jews were meant to go each year, perhaps remembering the time he visited as a boy and got so carried away in conversation with the rabbis that he missed his parents leaving and got left behind. Maybe he was hoping for a similarly intense spiritual experience, a moment to recharge himself, to feed his soul and to feel close to God before he continued his demanding ministry. The temple was traditionally a place where the poor, the disabled and the disenfranchised could go and know that they would be fed spiritually as well as physically. However, when Jesus walked in on this day, he found the outer courtyard filled with people whose intention was clearly to fleece the poor and make a profit out of their religious obligation. Worshippers attending the temple needed to pay a temple tax, but this could only be paid in non-Roman money. So money changers had set up stalls where people could get the correct coins. However, they would charge inflated rates for the exchange in order to make a fat profit. Similarly, people went to the temple to make sacrifices to God. A pair of pure white doves, for example, or a pure white goat kid or a lamb. Now, such pure animals were not ten a penny. So a bit of an industry had sprung up around disguising the animals markings so that they could be passed off as acceptable. It would be a bit like if York Minster decided to charge people for receiving communion, but only in their own Minster currency, and then tried to pass off mouldy bread as communion wafers. Not OK. So you can see why Jesus was taken aback. The structures around the Jewish faith, the laws, the commandments, the traditions were meant to set people free. They were meant to give them structure within which they could thrive and become closer to God. Instead, he found corrupt systems designed to trap people and exclude them, to make their lives harder and their purses emptier. 
all the same, the image of Jesus and his behaviour that we're then given is pretty shocking. Whatever happened to gentle Jesus, meek and mild? He's gone all Avengers on us, wrecking the outer court of the temple and driving people out with a whip as if they were animals. I wonder how comfortable you are with an angry Jesus. Does it sit well with you or does it make you feel alarmed? I suspect that some of us needing a little love and kindness in our lives might find this story really discomforting. For others, however, it might be a relief because Jesus is showing that in the right circumstances, it is absolutely OK to be angry. Not the kind of random, unfocused anger that hurts everybody it touches, but the kind of anger that seethes at injustice, that wants to right wrongs, that longs to see the mighty toppled. Made in God's image, we feel anger too, but all too often we're taught from a very young age that our anger is unacceptable. It's now well known that unexpressed anger can turn inwards and lead to depression. Getting our anger out and using its energy to right wrongs and to do good for others is a cathartic and healthy thing to do. Here is Jesus showing us that it is absolutely all right to feel really strongly about stuff. I guess that the past year will have left many of us with strong emotions, but no real outlet. Perhaps if this is you, you can, in your imagination at least, join Jesus in turning over a few tables and raging at the unfairness of the way the world works. In his attack on the money changers and merchants in the temple forecourt, Jesus was fundamentally challenging what the temple was for in a way that I think challenges us to ask what church is for. Why do we go to church? Why do we sign in to the Sunday services online? What's drawing us here? Church is a place for people to flourish, to practice our gifts, to care for one another, to exchange ideas and, of course, to worship God. Corruption and exploitation have no place here any more than they did in the temple. And we've seen the church trying to sort out some of its own issues around abuse scandals and corruption in recent times. Over this past year, the way in which we do church has fundamentally changed. Unable to meet in person, we've needed to get creative going online, using paper service sheets posted through people's doors, holding ever smaller weddings and funerals and putting many other things on hold. We haven't even been able to receive communion for large chunks of the year. Everything we thought we held dear about our church services has been turned over, scattered, driven out by the need to keep each other safe. This, as I'm sure you might have experienced, is what God does. In God's kingdom, everything is topsy-turvy, turned on its head. All our worldly values, all our preconceptions, securities and habits are tipped over and shaken around. What seems sane and normal to us is foolishness to God. What is wise to God seems like idiocy to the world. God calls us to let go of the things that mislead or corrupt us, the things that distract or blind us, because hanging on to those things means losing something far more valuable. Those who try to save their life will lose it. As we start to come out of lockdown, I wonder what you would like to restore and what you would like to leave scattered. I don't know whether the people of the temple in Jesus's day resumed their old ways or changed them, but we have a chance now to think differently about how we are the church and how we'd like to be. We also have a chance to think about how we are in ourselves and how we'd like to be. St Paul taught us that we are each of us temples of the Holy Spirit. As surely as God dwelt in the temple in Jerusalem, God now resides in us. How will we demonstrate the wisdom of God in the way we live and act? And will we invite Jesus in to sweep away 
the foolishness of the world? Well, these are big questions for a Sunday morning in March, but it's spring and the season for spring cleaning is upon us. Perhaps over the last year you've been furloughed or had all your retirement activities snatched away by the pandemic and you've had very little to do but clean your house. So it might be time to turn your attention inwards for a while and think about what decluttering can be done on the inside. Or perhaps you've spent the last year juggling work and family and other commitments and your house is, shall we say, testament to that busyness? So as Lent continues and the hours of daylight grow longer, I invite you to get your metaphorical feather dusters out and chase some cobwebs away. It might seem like foolishness to you, but it will look like wisdom to God and will bring us into resurrection life. Amen. Let us affirm our faith together. We believe in God the Father, God Almighty, by whose pain earth and heaven sprang to being, all created things began. We believe in Christ the Saviour, Son of God in human frame, virgin born, the child of Mary, upon whom the Spirit came. Christ, who on the cross forsaken, like a lamb to slaughter led, suffered under Pontius Pilate, he descended to the dead. 
We believe in Jesus risen, heaven's King to rule and reign, to the Father's side ascended, till as judge he comes again. We believe in God the Spirit, in one church below, above, saints of God in one communion, one in holiness and love. So by faith, our sins forgiven, Christ our Saviour, Lord and Friend, we shall rise with him in glory to the life that knows no end. As we hold on to our assurance of faith, we turn to God himself to seek his forgiveness. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We long for the fire of God's cleansing to touch our unclean lips, for our guilt to be removed and our sins wiped out. So we meet Father, Son and Holy Spirit with repentance in our hearts. We pray together. God of mercy, we acknowledge that we are all sinners. We turn from the wrong that we have thought and said and done and are mindful of all that we have failed to do. For the sake of Jesus who died for us, forgive us all that is past and help us to live each day in the light of Christ our Lord. Amen. May Almighty God, who sent his Son into the world to save sinners, bring you his pardon and his peace, now and for ever. Amen. We're going to sing again, and Caris and Tony are going to lead us in a lovely song based on one of the Psalms. As the deer pants, for the water, so my soul longs after you. And following that, Beth is going to lead us in our intercessions this morning. the church and the world and thank God that he is with us. 
even in the most difficult of times. We pray for God's wonderfully created world, with its naturally balanced ecosystems, and ask that where mankind has upset that balance, there will be both the desire and opportunity to put things right. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all Christian churches that they will continue to reach out to people in new and innovative ways with the message that Jesus Christ came into the world to save us all, without exception, and with total love, if only we will follow him. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In a world which has been so disrupted by the pandemic, we pray for wisdom, the true wisdom that comes from God, for all those who are in positions of authority. We ask that they will make sound decisions for the good of the people they have the privilege to serve. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those whose businesses have been damaged or destroyed by successive lockdowns, and for those who have lost their jobs and their confidence. In other countries, people are contending not only with similar practical and financial issues, but also with restricted political and religious freedom and civil unrest. We pray for everyone who is struggling to feed their family and for all those who are fearful about the future. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks for the scientists who have worked together to create vaccines against COVID-19 and for the many who have assisted in administering them. We pray that these vaccines will be distributed fairly across the world to as many people as possible. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for families and their children as they prepare for the return to school on Monday. For those working in isolation from home and for everyone whose life is restricted and lonely. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those who are ill, both physically and mentally, at home or in hospital, and for those who care for them. We give thanks for the NHS doctors, nurses, carers and support staff, and pray for their health and well-being through this difficult time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Finally, we remember the terrible loss of life over the past year. We remember with fondness Jack Welburn, who worshipped at St Stephen's for many years, and who died last week. We pray for his partner Pam and for all those who are mourning the loss of loved ones. We also pray for those who have been unable to visit family members at the end of their lives or attend funerals. May they be comforted by knowing that we may all share in God's eternal kingdom, which was revealed to us through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now let us say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done 
on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you to Jane who shared with us today in her sermon. It was lovely to have somebody else sharing with us. Next week, being Mothering Sunday, we have somebody else who's coming to preach. And I'm pleased that we can welcome the Archdeacon of York. I do hope that uh, you will continue on with the Live Lent booklets. And if you haven't got one but would like one, please let me know. And if you need to get in touch with us for any reason, whether it's to um, share with us, to ask us to pray for you, or you'd like more information about the parish, just go to our website and contact us through that. Through that website, you can also get details if you want to contact us to join us for our Thursday uh, morning fellowship, coffee and fellowship uh, by Zoom. And also we have uh, a number of home groups that meet by Zoom at different points in the week. And if you'd like to be partaking in any of that, then let us know. We're going to sing our last hymn now. Praise to the holiest in the height. So our closing prayers, we say together. Lord Jesus Christ, you humbled yourself in taking the form of a servant and in obedience died on the cross for our salvation. Give us the mind to follow you and to proclaim you as Lord and King to the glory of God the Father. Amen. 
the Lord bless you and watch over you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look kindly on you and give you peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen.